We are now live on HHTV, so we may begin. Welcome. Welcome to this program on low-income housing in the First Hill neighborhood. This program is sponsored by two committees of Horizon House, the Neighborhoods Committee and the Diversity Awareness Committee. So I thank them and their help in, this partic in participating in this. And I would like to welcome especially, let me just, our guests from Bellwether, staff members and residents. It is wonderful to have you participating in this. Your presence is very, very important to this program and I know it's gonna be good. Uh, our, our residents are very, very interested in learning more about uh, homelessness and low-income housing generally. And now, especially that they'll be learning about the presence of wonderful facilities operated by Bellwether right outside our door in the First Hill neighborhood of Seattle. They, many of them will have already passed those buildings on their walks without realizing what function they serve and how important they are to our community. So uh, I'm delighted that we're doing this program. It's gonna make a big difference in the long run as well as the short run in people's understanding of the problems and how we are cope, coping to deal with them as best we can. And the fact that we, It'll be a while before we're able to uh, fully develop the infrastructure that we need to take care of the various people who are homeless and with low incomes and need, need to have affordable housing provided for them. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Susan Boyd, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Bellwether Housing. Uh, and you know, Bellwether is the uh, largest provider of low-income housing, affordable housing. We sometimes we say uh, a, a housing affordable for low-income people. It's easier to say low-income housing. They mean the same thing. Uh, that's throughout the throughout this community, the greater greater King County uh, community. They are the leading provider of affordable housing. Uh, Susan is the chief executive officer of Bellwether, and um, has been committed through her entire career to creating affordable, affordable, diverse, and vibrant communities. It's a career that included direct social service, policy analysis, and mastering the remarkably complex law of putting together the finances to build low-income housing. Produce. Now, prior to Susan's appointment she, as the CEO, uh, she served as Bellwether's Director of Real Estate Development. And during her tenure there, she tripled the number of housing units Bellwether has in production for that purpose. Uh, so you'll hear a little bit from Susan and see on the slides, the growth that Bellwether has been able to accomplish, which is making a big, big difference for a lot of people. With those kinds of credentials, it's not surprising that Susan serves on the Governor's Affordable Housing Task Force. And we will continue to benefit from her vision and skills for many more years through her service on the Affordable Housing Committee of King County's Growth Management Planning Council, which is given the task of planning the future that will unfold in our communities over the next several decades. Her expertise and advice is invaluable. Now, Susan has been featured in several prior programs here on homelessness and might be familiar and you say, oh yeah, I remember Susan now, uh, we put it together. Uh, programs on homelessness and low-income housing. So I'm gonna turn it over to Susan to run the program and introduce the other guests and uh, say, welcome, Susan, welcome back. Thank you, Peter. Um, and thank you so much uh, to all of you at Horizon House for your interest in affordable housing. Uh, I, have, um, I have had the opportunity to speak with you before and uh, taken you to, I've had great, great opportunities to meet with you in person um, and look forward to doing that again someday soon. Um, 
and I know that the reason I have been in your midst um, several times is because of your deep interest in our community and affordable housing in particular. Um, and uh, Peter, I know you in particular are very involved in advocacy and in supporting organizations that advocate for um, good policy and deep investments in affordable housing. And I know the rest of you um, get in, dabble in that world as well. So thank you for all of that. It's, it's vital. Um, so I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit. I mean, give you a little bit of history of Bellwether. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, what we're up to currently. Um, I'll try to put it all in the context of the affordable housing crisis we face. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about on numbers about the affordable housing crisis. If you have specific questions, ask me. But um, I, I kind of walk into rooms uh, around Seattle figuring that most people are very familiar with the need for more affordable housing. Um, I will, um, I, I, because you all are located in the heart of, uh, you're kind of like in the a ground zero for uh, our affordable housing portfolio. Um, it kind of spans out from you all. Some of our first, very first acquisitions were in your neighborhood. And so it's kind of fun to be able to talk about those um, and give you a little context as you walk around your neighborhood. Um, and then we're gonna turn it over to Elliot Swanson, who's our Director of Resident Services, um, who's gonna talk about our Resident Services Program. And then um, we're lucky enough to have a couple of our residents here, um, John and Bonnie. Um, <clears throat> and Alexia is one of our Resident Services Coordinators who is uh, making uh, her, her office available for Bonnie to join us. So um, thanks to all of you uh, uh, Bellwether folks for joining us. And <clears throat> Amy is there running the slideshow. Amy is our Director of Communications and Development. Um, so a little history about Bellwether. We were formed in uh, 1980. The um, Downtown Seattle Association um, saw a need to create housing that was affordable to people who were working in the downtown core at that time. Uh, and <clears throat> it was a little bit, there was, there was, if you look into the history of people's opinions about what should happen in downtown Seattle, there was a lot of kind of, there, there were some people who really believed that the core of downtown was for business and business only. It was the highest and best use should be only um, commercial uses and that housing shouldn't exist. And there was another sort of core group of people who believe strongly that a vibrant downtown, a vibrant city core um, required, uh, included people um, who, who called the downtown home. And uh, fortunately for us, I guess, the, um, the, the folks who believed that downtown should be, a, should be home to people and be affordable to people who wanted to call it home, um, won out. And, and we were, we were created um, out of the business district, which is a little different than many of our other um, sort of sister organizations, some of which came out of the faith community, some came out of kind of community-based um, advocacy organizations. So we're a little bit unique in that way. Um, today, we've got about uh, 2,600 units. There's our number right there. Um, in operation um, from south, uh, from Kent all the way up to Northgate uh, and pretty much along the transit corridor. Um, we have a, it's pretty diverse um, set of buildings that we have and you'll see a sampling of that um, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, some of our buildings are specifically for seniors um, and disabled people. Some of them are really focused on families. Um, some of them have, um, are, uh, you know, like I said, in the downtown core, some of them are more, um, are, are, are further, are a little bit further out, but deeply connected to transit. So it's easy to get downtown. Um, we have about 20% of the people who move into our buildings come directly out of homelessness. 
But we also have people who live in our buildings who <clears throat> work in grocery stores and um, are, you know, our childcare providers, um, probably some folks who work at Horizon House, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, folks who work in the hotels downtown and um, drive Ubers and Lyfts. Um, so lots of, it's just a real, um, it's a very diverse set of, of residents that we serve. Um, we are pretty committed to building high quality housing. Um, we have a mix of building, older buildings that we acquired and newer buildings that we constructed. And you'll see a sampling of that too. Pretty good, actually pretty good representation of that. Um, and we try to be really deeply involved in the neighborhoods in which um, we build our housing. <clears throat> Um, yeah, Amy, I think you could, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Here's just a, a example of um, some of the, the kinds of, our, our, the income range of folks that we serve, so might be zero, um, no, folks who are not yet signed up for benefits, are out of work um, and have virtually no incomes, to people making, um, 60% of the area median income. And for a family of four, 60% of the area median is actually up a little bit above $60,000 a year. Um, and uh, actually it's, I think probably by now it's closer to $70,000 a year. Um, for a single person, 60% of the area median income is about $50,000 a year. And right now, those incomes are not enough to afford pretty much any kind of housing in Seattle that is market rate housing. Um, yeah, no, that's fine, Amy. I can go ahead and start talking about, so the, um, the 2,600 units or so that we have um, includes uh, 36 buildings um, and one of, my favorites is the Cambridge. Uh, and the Cambridge is a building that you all can look out of um, some of your windows there on the, to the looking north from Horizon House and see from, from your space there. Um, it sits down right there below, right kind of tucked behind the freeway. Um, the building, um, the, the Cambridge is our, I believe is our oldest building. It was built in 1923. It uh, was kind of built as a, and you know, of course, before the freeway. And so it had this kind of nice vista of downtown. Um, we renovated it um, fairly recently. You may remember seeing some of the construction activity out your window there. Um, did a very nice, as I know some of you have been into the lobby and it's quite beautiful. Um, and we, we restored the historic lobby there and um, did a lot of work on systems and stuff like that. Um, serves, they're mostly studios. Um, so small units, typically um, single adults or couples living there, um, 153 units. We'll hear more about that from, um, from Bonnie who lives at the Cambridge. Um, Cascade Court, um, 100 apartments. This uh, building is just up the street from you at 1201 Summit. Um, it, um, it was our first building that really emphasized, or one of our first buildings that really emphasized families. We have, um, it was, this was, this is built on land that was sold to us by a woman named, uh, Priscilla Collins, she was uh, one of the bullet, uh, she was Stimson Bullet's sister. Um, so there were three siblings in the Bullet family. And actually um, Amy was gonna, there's, I, I was, she sold us this land, you know, that the, the Stimson Manor is up there and there was a bunch of uh, Stimson property up there. And so this was meant to be a way to redevelop that site to include something that was visually compatible with those beautiful old mansions that you see up there. We lost our screen share, it looks like. 
I'm bringing it back up. Sorry, I tried to add that link and it wouldn't let me add the link in. So. Oh, okay. Um, that's okay. Maybe we can do that later. Um, John lives at Cascade Court, so he can tell us a little more about that building. Um, Amy, which one's next on the list? And I can just talk about it. Right next to Cascade Court is Tate Ma a Tate Mason building. Tate Mason is a um, was uh, used to be a parking lot of Virginia Mason Hospital. It is right up the street. Again, it is actually very close to Cascade Court up there. Um, it's a senior building. Um, as a, built right around the same time in the early 90s. Um, and all, all my cues are on the slide. Um, Sorry, I'm bringing it right back up. It's, uh, I'm having a technical issue. That's okay. Um, another building that is very close to you all is the Eagles Auditorium. Um, we have, uh, the, the, where the ACT Theater is, it's kind of at the base of Freeway Park. There we go. Um, and it is uh, both a robust theater space of the ACT Theater and includes 44 apartments, which a lot of people um, don't know. Um, so we've got our 44 apartments upstairs. Bellwether owns and operates the 44 apartments. Um, serving households whose incomes are at or below 45% of the area median, um, and many of them much, much lower than that. Um, we uh, own this, we own the housing portion of the building and the ACT Theater owns the ground floor. Um, I, the, one of the interesting parts of the history of this building um, is that this was, um, one of the places where Dr. Martin Luther King spoke on his one visit to Seattle, um, and he spoke in the theater here. Uh, it is, it was, um, we turned it, we, we redeveloped it with ACT Theater right around the time of the, con the convention center was um, originally being constructed. Olive Tower, here's another building that probably looks familiar to you. Um, this um, big, it, it's a little less noticeable than it used to be because it is now sits in the shadow of the, uh, the convention center expansion. Um, but here we have 86 apartments. Again, this was one of our early acquisitions, very small units, but um, at uh, serves a lot of downtown workforce. Um, Let's see, um, we uh, acquired it in 1984. So yeah, it was one of our very first acquisitions. Tate Mason, I talked about, this is our senior building, 97 apartments here. Um, really beautiful courtyard, nice community space. And then um, the rise on Madison, the rise on Madison will be our very first high rise that we've ever constructed. Um, this is on land that was uh, essentially given to us and Plymouth Housing uh, in partnership um, by Sound Transit. Um, once upon a time, Sound Transit thought that its Capitol Hill station uh, might actually be here at First Hill at the corner of uh, Madison and Boylston they decided that the site um, would have required too deep of a tunnel. And so they moved the site up to a little bit further north on Broadway, um, as you know. Um, then they had this uh, surplus land, <clears throat> used to be a money tree here. Um, we uh, are in the midst of construction of this building that you see, this is a rendering. Um, we, when it is complete, um, Plymouth Housing will own and operate 115 units for formerly homeless seniors on the first five floors. And Bellwether will own and operate 253 apartments on the upper floors 
studios, one bedroom, two bedroom and three bedroom apartments. So um, serving a mix of singles and larger families. Um, we're really excited about uh, bringing this one on. This is a uh, kind of a whole new venture for us given its scale and the building type. Um, and we were very happy to have really incredible support from the First Hill neighborhood um, in getting um, our permission to build this building from the city. So I will, I, I will now um, hand it over to Elliot. I think we're right on time. Elliot to talk a little bit about our resident services program. Hi everyone, I'm Elliot Swanson. I'm the Director of Resident Services for Bellwether Housing. Um, the Resident Services Program is really sort of the social services arm of Bellwether Housing. Um, it initially sort of sprung from a need to provide services at our HUD properties. Our HUD properties are three buildings that are exclusively for deeply low-income seniors. So people making zero to 30% area median income. Um, one of those buildings also serves adults with disabilities. And what we saw initially was there was a pretty strong need to help people age in place effectively, um, to interface with the larger sort of social services world and um, to build community at those properties. So, we have service coordinators at each one of those properties who provide a pretty robust level of support to folks living there. Um, as time went on, we sort of had, we started to learn that um, folks living at other properties of ours could benefit from su support, some more community building activities. And Bellwether has also increasingly become integrated with the response to homelessness. Um, so as Susan, mentioned, you know, we have all kinds of folks living in our buildings. We have folks working on master's degrees. We have folks who have master's degrees and are practicing social work or um, some other vocation that uh, doesn't compete with Amazon salaries. And increasingly, we have a lot of folks living in our buildings who are coming out of homelessness, who are on maybe some sort of like federal disability benefit or who have no income at all. So we've been expanding our services program to make sure that we can help those folks have, um, have a positive experience in our housing. A lot of that work really leans on um, helping people interface with the broader social services system. Through the pandemic though, we've leaned into providing some more direct services. So. Staffing model probably isn't of huge interest to you, but um, suffice it to say, we have um, sort of a medium level of support at all of our buildings and a pretty high level of support for our seniors. Get the next slide. Great. Um, traditionally, we've been very focused on housing stability. So that means helping people access financial resources so that they can pay their rent. Um, and addressing any sort of behavioral health issues that are coming up that affect people's ability to live in their communities. Um, as I mentioned earlier, another big focus of ours, especially at our senior properties, is helping people effectively age in place. We really want to provide services that help people stay in their independent apartments as long as possible. So that can mean helping someone um, get a caregiver so that they can you know, more easily take care of housekeeping tasks, doing fall prevention work um, in their building, maybe getting rid of some rugs, things like that, um, so that folks don't have to move into assisted living or they don't wind up hospitalized before they're ready to stop living in an independent situation. We do a lot of community building activities. We have um, cultural programming at our buildings that you guys have actually helped support. Um, we, yeah, I'll tell you more about the activities we're doing at our senior buildings later. Health promotion has become a bigger and bigger thing. Um, we've been doing COVID vaccine clinics at every site. We had early access to COVID vaccines back in 2021. We actually have a booster shot clinic tomorrow at um, Tate Mason House, uh, right down the street from you guys. I'm really excited about that. Um, we do yoga, we do gardening, we do all sorts of activities to help get people out of their apartments and engaged with their neighbors. Um, the big thing that we do is just sort of help people navigate the broader social services system in Seattle. 
the resources out there are forever changing. Um, they're complicated and different government agencies don't really do a good job of talking to one another. So my staff do a lot of work just sort of helping people figure out you know, what resources are they eligible for? Can they get on that low income, that reduced cost internet program? Um, are they eligible for a caregiver? Is that something they want? Are childcare services available in their neighborhood um, during the odd hours that you know, they're not at work? Um, um, and increasingly as sort of a COVID response, we've learned, we've leaned into some new initiatives. So rental assistance has obviously been a huge thing for us. A huge portion of our residents whose primary source of income was from employment, lost hours or lost their jobs completely at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so we've worked really closely with different government agencies to provide a little bit shy of two and a half million dollars in direct rental assistance to folks who lost work, um, or had other expenses related to the pandemic. We've been doing these vaccine clinics for, oh, it's a year and a half now. <laughs> um, it feels like it will never end. So we were able to secure early access to vaccines and it's really as January of 2021 um, for our medically compromised seniors um, at the HUD buildings and another building, Tate Mason House. We're continuing to do booster shot clinics and we'll continue to do that. Um, we also do flu shot clinics and other things like that. Food security was another area that we really leaned into. Um, a lot of our residents and especially a lot of our seniors really rely on public transportation to get the things that they need. That wasn't really a viable or safe option for a lot of folks, especially before we had a safe COVID vaccine. Um, so we worked with a lot of third parties to set up meal delivery, to do grocery delivery services, um, help people make sure they had the nutritional needs that they need without going and exposing themselves um, on public transportation. We're really trying to grow our employment supportive services right now. To, um, as I mentioned, a lot of our folks whose primary source of income was employment, lost work or lost hours. The economy has changed in a lot of ways too. While you hear, you know, unemployment is very, very low right now. Um, some jobs just simply didn't come back and a lot of people are going to require job training um, or some encouragement to try working in a field that they're maybe not familiar with. So we actually just onboarded an employment specialist who is going to be specifically focused on helping our residents get new jobs and get vocational training and succeed in those jobs. Um, technology access, this was another big thing that came out of the pandemic. We quickly realized that a lot of our seniors um, weren't accessing the internet, maybe they didn't have internet access themselves or didn't even have a device to access the internet. So we were able to procure tablets for a lot of our seniors um, at our HUD properties in Tate Mason House and distribute those so they could safely connect with family members or other members of their community um, online and minimize the risk of isolation as well as exposure to COVID-19. Um, Addressing behavioral issues is something we're also trying to sort of grow our program in. The pandemic has created a lot of stress for folks, frankly. Um, I think across our whole portfolio of housing, we've seen more folks who are isolated, who are experiencing a pretty high level of stress and just distress. So my team is sort of growing our capacity to work with folks who are experiencing behavioral health challenges. Um, yes, a little more on seniors. Yes, we got tablets for folks so that they could connect. I think I shared a lot of this already, actually, but these are the services that were really specific to seniors. Um, newest program of all, I'm actually really excited about this. Since folks have been cooped up in their apartments, um, we recently found out about a new program that will help people get air conditioners in their units. Um, I'm sure you, you guys experienced the heat wave last year. It's only going to get worse year after year after year. So I'm really excited we're able to bring this benefit um, 
to our income qualified seniors and folks living with disabilities so that they can safely stay in their units. Um, we've also sort of been able to build some remote programming, which was new to us. We were very accustomed to doing in-person things in our community spaces. So we've done like poetry contests. We've set up some discussion groups. We did a virtual cooking class at one of our buildings that was well received. Yeah, and so cultural and community programming. This is something that I'm really happy to have the support of Horizon House around. Um, we've recently done some big outings. Uh, we were able to take a lot of our residents up to Snoqualmie Falls really recently. And that's fantastic because people have mobility issues. They don't have access to transportation, getting people connected to the outdoors and in spaces where they can um, be with each other safely is really important to us. And we have some upcoming trips to some local institutions you might be familiar with, the Mohai, Kubota Gardens. Um, yeah, we also do a lot of other um, community building activities. Our yoga classes, we're starting back up. We're tamping them down a little with the recent COVID surge. Um, cooking and nutrition has been really popular with our seniors too. We had a partnership with the UW to develop a curriculum specifically for seniors living in our buildings who have um, pretty limited budgets for uh, food resources. We've set up some walking groups too and other sort of COVID safe activities. Um, again, though, like a big part of what we're also still doing are informational events for seniors. So we do an annual Medicare open enrollment presentation um, with some folks from the state. We provide end of life planning um, presentations, which are done by a third party. And we do social security benefit reviews um, with folks pretty regularly. This was a trip you guys supported, and I just wanted to share this quote um, from Lynn here. She's the lovely lady on the right. She writes, it's like you read my mind. It was on my bucket list to make it back to the mountains, and I had no idea how I was going to make it happen. You don't know how much it means to me to be able to do something I didn't think I'd ever be able to do again. Um, so thank you for your support of um, these cultural outings. It really means a lot to people. And it's not always feasible for us to, you know, pull a couple hundred dollars to get transportation. Transportation is expensive these days um, to get folks out of their apartments. It helps us reduce isolation. It helps people connect with one another um, and just provides a much more meaningful experience for folks um, in our housing. Well, what else? Yeah, yeah um, I would. I, I must be candid, we still have challenges. Um, these are sort of specific to our older population, but we do have a lot of residents who remain pretty isolated. Um, this is again, another vestige of COVID, but there's, there's still quite a few folks who um, we struggle to connect with and who have pretty limited connections with friends and family. And this is something that's always kind of top of our mind. We'll do like phone check-ins with people um, who are interested, but there's folks that we're still trying to find new ways to engage with. We'll always be trying to find new ways to engage with folks. Um, we do have a lot of older adults who's uh, who are still working, which is fantastic. Unfortunately, a lot of folks are still struggling to return to work, um, specifically at Tate Mason House. That's a challenge that some folks have. So. Again, we're trying to sort of ramp up those services a little bit more, help people get back into the workplace if they're interested in working. Uh, technology troubleshooting is just a constant challenge. My team could spend you know, most of their day helping folks set up email accounts, set up online banking, and sort of navigate the ever-changing world of technology. So um, yeah, that's a, just a constant challenge of ours. Um, Another big challenge, this is this is something that we run into with some frequency. A lot of folks who are eligible for services and would benefit from them don't want to take advantage of those services, like, which I totally get. I don't necessarily want someone in my house helping. Well, I, actually, I would love someone to come to my house and help with cleaning and cooking, but I'm not eligible for that. Um, but we have a lot of folks who are very reluctant to take advantage of services that they are eligible for. Um, the approach that we like to take is like, look, you pay taxes your whole life. 
you know, you've paid for these services. Um, and also, you know, if you take advantage of some services now while you're living in independent housing, you're not going to need to go to that assisted living facility in two years. You're going to be able to stay in your apartment with a little bit of help um, right now. And, you know, you're actually going to be more independent for a longer period of time um, if you engage. So some people, some people get that. Others um, have a lot of pride and I, we respect that as well. You don't have to get services if you don't need to. Housekeeping is also a persistent challenge of ours, especially um, post pandemic. We typically do unit inspections um, once a year to make sure that people's apartments are in order, um, that there aren't any fire hazards or health issues in folks' units. And we paused all of that during the pandemic. We were just going to go into people's units, you know, left and right. Now they're resuming and we're seeing there's, you know, some folks who are going to need a little bit more help getting their units into a place where they can be safe and healthy. So, um, yeah, I think that's all from me. Any questions? I would suggest Elliot move on to the residents and hear their stories. Uh, John, why don't you, um, why don't you take it over for now? Hi. <clears throat> thanks, I'm John thanks so much for being here. Yeah. Okay. I'll just bring you to start. Uh, thanks for having me on here. And hi, I'm John Bentley, and I live in Cascade Court Apartments on First Hill in Seattle. And I have a story for you that I hope you'll find informative. I'm speaking to you from a kind of unusual perspective. I've been a Bellwether Properties resident since 2003, and I've had positive experiences with each move that's helped change my life for the better. And I'm glad to be able to share this today. It takes a lot to make somebody wanna give a presentation for the first time since college 40 years ago. I am 62. <laughs> but when I saw the poster up in the lobby, I knew I had to do this. It's like it's one of those, if not now, when, if not who, me. And here I am. It takes a lot to make somebody want to do this, but I'm glad to be able to do it. Not once, but twice in the last 20 years, my life has turned around because I moved into one of your buildings. So I just consider it kind of a good karma and an opportunity to say thanks. Because in both instances, these places that I moved into from Bellwether, they helped me stay in Seattle and keep my friends and longtime contacts and and if I didn't have these opportunities to stay in either of these buildings, I would have had to leave the city for lack of affordable housing. And that's been a, a, a huge uh, story, actually. I mean, first, a bit of backstory. My first experience with Bellwether came in November of 2003. I moved into an SRO row unit in the Bellboy Apartments at 1411 Boylston Avenue. Now, uh, it was two blocks from where I'm now living, which is another story by itself. But the place I moved into then was warm, and it was bright, it was well-maintained, and it had a clean, well-kept bathroom down the hall for three units, and the rent was only three twenty-five, dollars which is about half of what I was getting for a month, and it, including the heat. And the location was really quite amazing, and still is. And it was as walkable and convenient as anywhere in the U.S. for a major city. And I was been really grateful for that over the years because I found my neighbors to be generally friendly and quiet and it was safe as well. And it was a fresh start in a new neighborhood for a born again hipster. I am a lifelong rock and roll guitar player and uh, it was a good place for me. It helped that my neighbors liked music and it also helped that I used a really tiny practice amp so there weren't any issues in my time there. My time there at the first residence on Boylston would be 17 years. And I was there for some pretty intense times, as we all know, both personally and for the public. There was so much going on all around, and yet there was one constant I could rely on. I had this place. We all face lots of uncertainties, we all know. It's pretty obvious right now. I'm not going to try to pile on cliches if I can help it, but if I'm staying here, I was able to be creative and be myself, and that's beyond any words. It's been a time of great personal <clears throat> growth. 
During the years I spent at the Bellboy, when it was a Bellwether property for 15 of those 17 years, I managed to maintain friendships, keep jobs, and ultimately pursue health goals that might not have been thinkable or possible in a less positive environment. I was a psychology major back in college, and I will, won't bore you with any too many details, but I remember Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, pyramid of human needs, and the safety and security is the base of that pyramid, and the foundation you build on that. And knowing that I had that, made progress possible. It gave me the confidence to move forward. And at, at the crossroads in our lives, I'm thinking you move into uncharted areas. It helps to have a place that aids in your judgment, especially if one's judgment can be a little bit shaky at times. My own situation isn't really unique. I'm on SSI. There can be a stigma or a bad rap sometimes of being on the margins of society and not really a full member. But my experiences, I will add with Bellwether, have helped me to transcend some of my own doubts and self-imposed limitations. And there, in my own place, I was every much a Capitol Hill resident as that techie across the street shelling out 2K for the privilege. I was able to maintain a sense of stability also during the time of personal endeavors. I'll skip the drama. Let's just say I used to drink a lot and it's been six years of happy, comfortable mornings. There's been a lot of changes, and we sure know that, and about Seattle and neighborhoods and ourselves. And there's been a lot to try to keep up, whether it's just our spirits or our level of style. And then there's maintenance. Yeah, maintenance. There's a lot to be said about the buildings that I have lived in and have been repaired over these many years. And it bears mention, it's given me inspiration to want to do this. I've been a builder over the year, various years from a framer to masonry and landscaping, and I've worked in maintenance. And I need to mention in the 15 years that Bellwether ran the Bellboy, my old building, it was given several major upgrades and timely repairs. We got a new bathroom remodels in 05 and 17. We had a painted a house painted in 2011, and a brand new roof was added in 2013. And we also had the carpeting in the hallways replaced a couple of years before I left. And during my long stay at the Bellboy, I did have some repair issues because you will have a couple. And I'm happy to share here that everything got fixed quickly and well during the uh, time the Bellwether ran the Bellboy. I know how difficult it can be to keep up these old buildings. I've had jobs in them. <laughs> I got to say that the heat always worked well and anything hot water or plumbing related got fixed as soon as possible. And a shout out to Matt Colasurdo here, my first manager at the Bellboy way back, and to several other maintenance guys whose names I can't quite remember right now, but you're all awesome. It's important for me to also add that despite the considerable turnover over time, stuff still got done regardless. But John? Yes. I um I know that the folks at Horizon House have a have another um uh, thing they need to do at one o'clock. So I just want to, um, uh, I'm giving you a time flag so that we can have some time for Bonnie to. Oh, sure. Oh, no problem. Well, yeah. I will actually cut to the last uh, page and, uh, <laughs> and say, I'd like to really, really, really thank Kaya, the mm -hmm. building manager at uh, Cascade Court. And she was also a wonderful building manager. I also have to add during the time that I spent at the Bellboy. And my time here has been very, very positive. And I appreciate you giving me the chance to tell the story. John, thank you so much. I love um, hearing the shout out for the, um, the maintenance team and for Kaya. She's amazing. Uh, so I really you know, appreciate that. It, may, it has made a difference. And like I said, you inspired me to want to volunteer to, to do this for you. So thanks a lot for having That's me great. on. I will take that back to the teams. Um, Bonnie, it's time for to hear from you. Um, I moved. I moved into the Cambridge, coming off of homelessness. My two pups and I were homeless for two years on Capitol Hill. I kind of hung out at my son's couch, 
And he was actually the one that found the Cambridge for me and encouraged me to get in. And at the time, Hank was the manager here and he and he did everything to facilitate my movie. And at the time I rented my apartment, um, it wasn't finished. Raven was still working on the remodeling of this building. And so I've seen the progress and it's just been fantastic. Uh, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful historical building. And I love my apartment. It's been perfectly located on the floors and in the, in the neighborhood. Um, I am 70 years old and I have not ever lived in an apartment building like this before. Oops. <laughs> Still here. And it's not, just not been. Oh, no. Okay, well, this has been great. I appreciate the residents coming and sharing their stories with us. I wish we had more time, my golly. But, you know, we're, we're pretty busy here for old folks. And we, <laughs> we have all sorts of things going on. And there's something that follows us right away. And they need a little time to set up. Um, uh, Sorry about that, everyone. I got a call and it kicked us off Zoom. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Uh, so I think we'll have to dispense with any questions, one or two maybe burning questions, and uh, we'll have to call it a day. Raise your hand or share. You know, any, any of our panelists who are resident? Mary, Mary Margaret has a question. I have not heard a lot about uh, school age children. Uh, is that because Bellwether specializes in over 21 or have they just not been mentioned? And how are they served if they are? Well, Mary Margaret, I will tell you that um, I think one of the, um, actually at Cascade Court, we have quite a few families. Um, and so we, when we were focusing on the down on your neighborhood, um, really it's just that building that has families in it. And um, John doesn't happen to represent one of those families. So that's just the emphasis here. But we have a lot of kids in our building. And in fact, our efforts over the past um, few years have really emphasized family sized units. We build as many two, three, and four bedroom units as we can possibly build with the funding we, we have. Um, it is more expensive to do those um, units, but we do as many as we can up to half of the units in some of our new buildings are um, family-sized units. Um, Elliot can talk to you a little bit about the kinds of, um, we, we have close working relationships with, school dis with the school district. Um, we bring in um, folks from li the libraries to do programming for kids. There's, um, we've recently had an effort to get as many kids as possible into swim lessons. Um, Elliot, are there other things you wanna highlight quickly? Yeah, that's an area like I'd really like to grow the program in, especially with after school education. Um, we have had a lot of success, as Susan mentioned recently, with getting kids into swim classes. A lot of our families um, come from places where they didn't have access to pools or swim lessons. We have a lot of parents who don't know how to swim. Um, we, I guess I'll share, we experienced a tragedy um, or one of our younger residents died last year. Um, and so as sort of a consequence of that, we, have been trying to get as many kids as possible into swim lessons, um, make sure kids know how to be safe around water. And that's been going well. During COVID, yeah. we had, um, there was a lot of, you know, we worked really hard to make sure kids were still connected with their schools. We're getting, the, and parents were getting the resources they needed to support their kids during at-home education. So, we do have uh, kids programming at, uh, at many of our buildings. Uh, I think um, Elliot was focused on some of our senior buildings as we were talking today. Uh, schools, can you mention a couple schools they attend? 
Are they bused? All over the city. Um, we have kids, we have kids in probably, I, I don't know, every, uh, just about every school, maybe possibly with the exception of West Seattle. Um, but we have kids all over the, in most of the public schools throughout the city. There's a question on our, uh, on, on the uh, question board. What are your staffing challenges? Um, I would say our staffing challenges right now, the, the market is very um, good for job seekers. Um, and so our, our staffing challenges are making sure we're able to compete um, with the market for salaries for folks who have, um, you know, our accountants, our maintenance staff, our property managers can work as well for a nonprofit as, as they can for a for-profit and um, potentially make more money. And so we have to be very careful about keeping up there. Um, I would say that is one of our biggest challenges. And honestly, you know, it's been a really stressful time for everybody and for our residents in particular. And so another challenge is making sure that our staff um, are safe, are um, feel, are supported in a way that allows them to be the supports they need to be when they um, are working with residents. Um, and that they, they feel like they have um, the, the backing of the rest of the organization to do their jobs. Um, Marsha, did you have a question? Uh, real quick question and answer, because we, uh, we're actually past our deadline for turning over the TV to another oh, person. Oh, I see. Yeah. So uh, was it Marsha or I saw I, I, I didn't keep track of who was first. So I'll let you pick yeah. Peter. Yeah, I noticed May first, so I will go to her. I was wondering what your biggest need is. Um, and I'm thinking of ways that Horizon Health residents could contribute. Would it be time, money, or services? Um, well, it's I, I would I would say that money is the easiest, uh, the most flexible that we can deploy. Um, we don't have a robust volunteer program. Um, COVID has sort of set aside our attempts to get something started in that area. Um, so, just speaking frankly, I would say that money is something. We, our resident services program is supported primarily with contribution, private contributions. Um, and it be, as we expand, we are about to add another almost thousand units to our portfolio in the next year or so, um, which means probably 3000, maybe more um, individuals um, probably who need a lot of services. So I think um, contributions to support our resident services program. We are going to have to close. I'm so sorry. Folks in Horizon House, contact me and maybe we can work ways to get your answers, uh, answers to your questions. I, I'd love to be able to do that. Uh, I want to thank all of, the, all of Bellwether, those who are present, of course, and those who aren't. Uh, and it's a wonderful organization. Uh, special thanks to our two uh, resident guests, John uh, and Bonnie. That was great for you to share your time with us. And someone nodding her head is Amy, who has been my partner on this project uh, and just a phenomenal go-to person, the uh, communications director, the development and communications director of Bellwether. So at this point, I think we will have to just wave goodbye and thank everybody once more. Thank you.